joining Time Out with PSOA, where sports officials share their stories to help recruit, train, educate not only sports officials, but players, coaches, administrators, and fans. Through this information, we're going to help make us all better for the game. Thank you for taking time out with PSOA. Today, we jump into another sport. The sport we will be talking about is wrestling. Our guest today is James Drescher. He is a NSAA state tournament wrestling official. James, welcome to the show. Time out with PSOA. If you could introduce yourself and your credentials as a wrestling official uh, for the audience. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sean. Uh, like like Sean said, I'm James Drescher. Um, I've done the individual state tournament now four times. I've done state duels twice, and uh, I've actually been selected, and I went out and have uh, officiated the NHSCA Nationals out in Virginia Beach. I've been doing it roughly about eight, nine years now. I'm certified with the NSAA, growing up uh, with, with a father who was a AD. I uh, I did officiate some junior high and elementary non-certified, which is kind of what led me into the sport. And we'll kind of get into that in full detail here later on. But thanks for having me, Sean. Glad you could join us. You know, you talked about, um, you know, how you got started. One of the things we do on the podcast is, is share our stories. And, you know, you talked about your father being an athletic director. How did you get your start as a wrestling official? And when you did get started why did you continue to remain and want to advance well it it started actually in high school uh one of my high school coaches uh, mark shernick at the time i was a freshman in high school always had us uh high school kids officiate the youth tournament that we put on for the club which was a fundraising event um to help raise funds for camps and clinics and stuff like that for our wrestling team so i started there um and as things kind of progressed a little bit uh, my dad, who was athletic director at the time, was short of an official and says, hey, I need a guy for a junior high meet. Can you jump in and uh, coincide a state tournament official? Uh, wasn't in the state tournament yet, but was officiating for quite a while. Guy Cope, um, he kind of brought me onto the scene and watched me a little bit as he officiated in Oakland. He says, hey, man, you're going on to college. You need to you need to get certified. Uh, he explained to me the ins and outs, um, helped me get certified by taking the test, going through the NSA website, which the NSA has done a phenomenal job uh, clearing up and making it easy to go take a test. But uh, that's kind of my story is, is, is I started with the elementary club level, uh, did a little bit of junior high, did some JV, um, never did any varsity for probably the first three, four years that I officiated um until i got certified and i think it was probably year two of being certified is when i actually got my first varsity wrestling contract and uh, i kind of owe all credit to getting certified to guy cope who uh the following year became a state tournament official so he's kind of a big part of my story of, of from where i started to to where i'm at now and then w- when you got that first varsity match you know what sort of egged you on to get to that varsity level and continue officiating at that level and beyond? Well, I, I think it's the passion and, and um, for the sport that I had growing up, but uh, there, there's some feelings when you call one of those perfect matches or there's a great scramble situation and you, you hold a call and, and kind of when you know you make that right call, it's almost like winning a match when you're wrestling in high school. Um, and, and it's, it's some of those emotions that, that I love that comes with officiating here in the roars in the gym. Um, and I mean, the roars in the gym is just one thing that really, really kept me going and, and giving back to the sport that, that has given me so much. Um, I guess that that's why I kind of continued maintaining doing what I did and, and help me lead to get to where I'm at. And I know, you know, this previous season, this was, I believe you said, um, another selection to the state tournament, wrestling individual tournament. What is it that you advise officials who want to get to that stage? What do they have to do? What have you done on and off the mat to be selected as a state tournament official? Well, to 
to be a state tournament official, uh, there's there's a there's a coach's voting process, and so the, so I, I'll I'll tell every official, don't be afraid to travel. Um, you need to go out there. You need to get exposure. Staying in staying in your little your comfort zone, right around your hometown area where everybody knows everyone. You got to get out of your comfort zone. I remember I would travel two and a half hours going out to Kearney, Nebraska to officiate, or trying to get into Omaha, or going as far northwest as O'Neill. Um, you know, you're going to have to put in some time, put in some of your own financial dollars. But I mean, officiating it, it pays well to to compensate for those mileage. But uh, the exposure to, to multiple different coaches um, is, is number one of, of what helps. Num- number two is is don't be complacent officiating. Um, when I first started, uh, I, I came in, I was young, 21, 22, rambunctious and and thought that, you know, I was I had everything and, and I was good enough to do th- do the state tournament. But, you know, at the end of the day, it comes to coaches votes and 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 surrounding yourself with with phenomenal individuals. And, and when I didn't make the state tournament, I almost I almost thought to myself, do, you know, do I really want to continue officiating? And and Guy Cope, once again, um, says, now keep going with it. You're doing good. You're doing the right things. Your time will come. And so at the time I looked at um, what I need to do to get better because I asked some coaches, what do I need to do? I talked to some of the NSA observers. They make the comments online. I read them and, and mat time. I just need more mat time. So I started doing more club meets. I, when I thought I was getting that level, I kind of quit taking some JV contracts and some junior high contracts and, and, and I kind of got complacent thinking that I should just do varsity only, which, which is a complete false statement because I think varsity is actually the easiest officiating compared to an elementary match where I always tell all these young kids that if you can keep an elementary match under 20 total points, you're holding your calls long enough in scrambled situations. Instead of throwing points in the air, you're waiting for control to be gained. You're, you're slowing everything down. And, and that's what... The number two thing that I tell kids is slow everything down, hold your calls, wait until it's secured. And then, like I said earlier, surrounding yourself with phenomenal individuals that have been to that level. So I looked, I looked on the program the year that I didn't make it. And I'm like, I got to surround myself with that guy and the three guys, I'll, I'll name it, uh, Tony Cordova, Trey Boyer, and Guy Cope. As an official, I looked at who was doing the best job, who controlled the mat area, uh, who had the least amount of drama. Because if you do your job, nobody knows you're there. So I surrounded myself with those guys and I started a group chat and I just, we started banging rules off each other and talking about situations and, and what do you think about this? And, and even asking coaches for video. Uh, hey, I, if you have a controversial call, get on a huddle or whatever they use for a video app and have them send you the video and then expose yourself and throw that out there for other people to critique and make judgment calls upon you. To, to elevate you to that next level and, and take everything with a grain of salt. Um, it's, it's very seldomly that, uh, that you'll actually feel like people are bewhittling you. It, it's not that it's, it's that other people do care about you. And when you surround yourself with those appropriate people, like, like I said, Trey Boyer, Tony Cordova, Guy Cope, they bring you along. And then next thing you know, I, it's I made the right corrections and and the willingness to learn and not be complacent. And then that's just kind of what led me into the next level of getting into the NSAA's eyes to get to the state tournament. You know, the the more we do podcasts and we talk to other officials, other sports, other areas of the country, the, there's so much common words and advice that our guests keep on saying over and over and over again. Um, you, you talk about just the experience and when you think you're ready, you need more experience and more experience because the more experience you get, the more prepared you're going to be when you are put on that big stage. Um, the passion, it, whatever your passion is, uh, James passion is wrestling, you know, follow that passion that, cause that passion is going to show in, in the work you do in that sport. And then surrounding yourself with other successful people, because um, who you <clears throat> surround yourself with is going to reflect your work in, in that respective sport. We're going to transition now into rules. Um, th- this podcast really 
wants to incorporate all people involved in the sport, the fans, the coaches, the wrestlers, um, and officials. And usually when we have situations of rules knowledge, it's lack of better words, ignorance. Uh, people don't know what that rule actually is and what the official's looking for. Um, so the three rules we talk, talked about was stalling, illegal moves, and, and then the pin versus near fall. So let's start with stalling. Um, what is the rule of stalling? And then what, as, as a wrestling official, do you look for to enforce that rule? It, you know, stalling and, and Sean, you being a, being official, you know, sometimes, you know, it's not how well you know the rule book and know the rule book by definition, but how you apply the rule book. Um, so stalling is a very controversial call. And that's when I was, when I was a young official, I found it that that was the toughest call to make because I was afraid that I was afraid that I was going to get taken to the table in the middle of a gym and a coach is going to be screaming at me. And, and so I was, I was so afraid to make that call because I didn't really know how to address those situations when, when a stall call presented itself and I would call it and a coach would be upset. And then I'd have to go to the table and try to explain myself while everybody in the gym is still kind of hoping, hollering, um, yelling. And, and if you're they're in disagreement, um, but at the end of the day, stalling is a judgment call by the official. You got, you got the rules in place to help you make that judgment call. But at the end of the day, it, it's your judgment to make that call. So probably one of the most controversial ones um, that I look at for stalling is, is when, when we're in the referee's position, you got a guy on top and a guy on bottom. And you can hear everybody in the gym and, and, the, and in the coach's corner yelling, he's got to get off the hips. He's got to get off the hips. And, and as an official, in that situation, I didn't learn it till honestly, probably two years ago making that call easier for me. If I can see separation between the top wrestler and the bottom wrestler, it means there's separation on the hips that he's not holding that guy down and overpowering him. Cause in the rule book, it states overpowering on the bottom is not stalling. So the top guys earned the right. He got the takedown, you know, he's working a two on one tilt or he's working a wrist trap. Uh, he's trying to sink the half before he gets out to the side and people are yelling at stalling. He's not getting off the hips. Well, if he's actively working to apply, a, a pinning situation and then gets out to the hips, you know, it's, it's not stalling. Um, but that's, that's a tough one to make is making that stall call and then going to the table. Um, a lot of coaches, um, know that the younger officials don't quite understand that questioning the judgment of official can technically be a coach's misconduct until I got comfortable. Um, and I've learned from Tony Cordova actually told me, you know, when you go to the table, approach the coach first and say, Hey, ask me what I saw there. Cause if, if you do that, you, you, you kind of put up a, a situation to where if the coach asks you, he's not questioning your judgment. He's asking you why you made that call, not telling you what you should have done. Um, so, so stalling at a young age can be so hard to make because it's very controversial and, and you're going to offend somebody when you make that call, unless it's really blatant and obvious. Besides that referee position, what are some other examples where you have judged a wrestler stalling? So in the rule book, you know, it says actively wrestle in the, you know, try to stay within that 10 foot circle. So on the, on the mat, you got that 10 foot circle and then you got your 28 foot circle, you know, trying to keep the action in the center. And as you watch college, those guys will back up and play the edge of the mat in the end. And the NFHS has made it easier. Um, when you back off the mat without attempting to circle, you can make that stall call, but a lot of kids will, will play the edge of the mat so they can use that out of bounds line as a, as a bailout area. And kids have gotten so good at learning how to bail to make it look like they're actively working on the edge of the mat, but somehow take the action out of bounds and therefore making that stall call um, like, hey, you're playing the edge or a kid continues to back up. And, and a lot of kids will use it as an offensive move too. You bait them, step them forward, you get them to step with the right foot and they get about five feet from the edge of the circle and then they shoot. You know, that's not a stall call. And it's, it's the ones that are using that edge as a, as, a, as a safety barrier. Like, ooh, if he gets in deep on a shot, I'm gonna make it look like I'm working, but somehow get out of bounds and get myself out of the situation. And so that's a tough one of, of, of engaging. Are they, 
are they playing the edge of the mat or are they just trying to set something up? And so that's, that happens generally from the neutral position in the third period when kids are tired. We're moving on to the, to the next rule topic. There, there's a lot of these, but illegal moves. Um, think about when you first started officiating, what were the illegal moves that were difficult to see, to officiate? And then now that you have the, the mat time, the mat experience, um, wh what do you look for now for illegal moves to prevent that injury? Well, a, a big one, um, and, uh, and that I just, just kind of thought of in my head is, is, you know, so there's, there's three forms of wrestling. You got freestyle, you got Greco Roman, and you got folk style. And so a lot of these kids are seeing, uh, local Nebraska kids going on wrestling freestyle and Greco and trying to make Olympics. I mean, we got a senior, uh, wrestler this year that is, is opting out of one year of college to try to make the world team, I think. Um, and then he's going on to Michigan. But one from a standing neutral position that's illegal, and generally most all most officials miss unless they they diversify themselves and and do freestyle and Greco is a key lock situation that puts a lot of pressure on a guy's radius and ulna. Um, so it starts with like a like a Russian tie, and he goes over the top of the hand, and then he sinks and he locks his own hand from underneath instead of over top. And so what he can do is he can pull that in tight and over the top, and it puts that radius ulna in a bad situation. I haven't seen any arms break because of that, but that is an illegal hold because it's it's very painful. Um, and then there's other illegal situations and rules like a full Nelson, for instance. You know, a lot of coaches, they see two hands come up underneath, and, and if it comes to, like, the side of their face, there's no pressure applied to the back of the neck, but they're wanting a full Nelson. But – what I'm doing is I'm delaying it enough to see if he brings both hands on top of the back of the head. And if he's applying pressure to the back of the neck for that to become a, become um, an illegal move or an illegal hold. And then probably from a refer from a referee's position where you got one guy, on one, one guy on top, one guy on bottom. Um, they call it the over scissors or uh, you got one leg in um, you you figure for the leg, which is the only part of the body you can, you're allowed to figure for. But then you drape your toe over the top and you put pressure against the knee joint. Um, it, it's not illegal. It's not illegal to drape it there, but it is illegal when the judge, when the when the official has that judgment that he's applying pressure to to that knee and hyperextending it. Um, that that rule probably gets it gets iffy there because once again it's it's a judgment if if it is an illegal move or if it isn't, and then draping head scissors. Um, that's one too. You can't scissor the head without an arm or have any pressure against the head or the neck. Um, that's that's also a judgment of the official if the, if he feels like there's pressure to the head or the neck area to whether it becomes an illegal hold. If it slips to there, you can maybe call it potentially dangerous, which is less controversial. But if you have to call it illegal, you better be able to explain your reasoning behind it. You know, working multiple levels of officiating, does your threshold or is there philosophy differences? of what you would call illegal move at a youth level versus a high school level? I wouldn't say there's a threshold, but there's reaction time. Um, so like on a locked hands call, that's illegal. High school, you know you better break it if you're on the mat. When I do like an elementary club meet, um, depending on what grade level it is, I allow a little bit more reaction time for it. Once you get to the high school level and you've been you've either been reffing for 10 years or wrestling for 10 years or you haven't, but you, you can comprehend the rules at a lot faster pace in high school than you can in that elementary level. Um, but there, I would say there's a little more leniency because at that youth level, um, you're really just trying to promote the sport of wrestling. Um, the less you can do to penalize on the youth level, the better, because it's such a, such a hard sport to get a grasp of. There's so many rules. Um, for instance, um, I look at control on a takedown situation. I'm not awarding it as fast as I possibly can like I do in high school versus elementary. I'm going to make sure you establish and maintain and hold that position for a one count in my head, which helps you, like I said earlier, keep that score under 20 total points. Um, so there's there's some more leniency with elementary than there is on, in that junior high, and you just kind of step it up on your way up. The, the last rule 
topic we're going to talk about is that near fall or pin. Um, I, I'm going to sort of throw myself underneath the bus here. Um, I, I'm a parent of two wrestlers. My, my daughter, Alexis, wrestles. My son, SJ, wrestles. Um, both are going to state tournament. And I've been up in the stands, you know, the best angle in the gym, right? 200 feet <laughs> in the air away. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. And here, I, I'm saying underneath my breath, that's a pin, that's a pin. And then that's the official. They're actually laying right there on the mat, taking a look at the shoulders. So explain to the, the audience, what is it you're looking for to get near fall points and then eventually that pin? So by definition or criteria for near fall, criteria for near fall occurs when any part of both shoulders or the scapula of the defensive wrestler are held within four inches of the mat or less, or when one shoulder or scapula of the defensive wrestler is touching the mat and the other shoulder or scapula is held at an angle of 45 degrees or less with the mat, or when the defensive wrestler is held on held in like a high bridge scenario where to describe a high bridge, basically the only thing that's touching the mat is the back of his head and two feet. And he's bridging up in the air, making a inverted U shape looking thing. Um, or when both elbows are, or he's supporting himself like in like a Peterson role or something like that, he's supporting his elbows on the mat to prevent himself, which he thinks from going from near fall, but that's actually near fall if he's supporting himself with his elbows. So wrestling, it's, it's very, it's very simple, right? You, you try to analyze 37 different situations and analyze, okay, is this, is this rule criteria? It's not like a, a three pointer. Okay. His feet were behind the line, the ball's in that's three points. So you got, you got your counts, you got your, your, your two is two, your three is two, and then your four is two. And then your, your five counts. So you got one, two, three, four. That's all worth two near fall in that counting situation. And then you have to get to a five to get to a full three near fall. So, you know, looking at that rule, I, I imagine there's a camera out there somewhere. I, I've, you, you hear some mom or dad up in the stands, up on the top row saying he's pinned and, and his shoulders literally three inches off the mat. And, you know, but they still have the better view of it. I, it, it it's, it's quite comical. Um, and, and, and to get the fall, you know, it, it, it's a two count of any part of the pinning area. So the pinning area isn't just the tops of the shoulder blades. It can be, I mean, it goes probably actually a third down the back. If, if, if you, there's a picture in the rule book that shows the whole pinning area, it's, 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 it's like a square box. So your scapula, how far your scapula goes down. If you feel your scapula, it's probably literally six to eight inches below. So like in a cradle situation, his shoulders are up off the mat, but his pinning area is on the mat. And then it gets real tricky with, with if they're inbounds or out of bounds in a pinning situation. So this rule for, for pinning is almost as collegiate of a rule that crosses over as there is. So if I'm on my back and say, Sean, you're on top. And the only thing inside that 28 foot circle is just one sliver of my back. Well, if you read the rule book, the rule book states that any and all, any part of the pinning area inside the circle on the mat, you, the action is still in. So in bigger gyms, bigger areas, it's an easier call to make. Um, but then you also got to look at safety concerns when you cross over and go into like a small class D gym where the the two, two out of bounds lines are right next to each other so are they impeding over in their space is action coming to your area but when you call that fall everybody is yelling they're out of bounds they're out of out of bounds but really they're inbounds if there's just one sliver of the pinning area still in bounds and if he's flat on the mat it's a pin see always learning and this one of the one things i love about doing this podcast um I always thought it was the shoulders. I did not know there was a pinning area. So um, that is definitely awesome to learn. So what's the most rewarding part of being a wrestling official? Oh, I mean, there's there's so many things that are rewarding with the sport. I don't know if I can narrow it down to one. Um, but uh, I would just say probably calling the most – it, it sounds a little cliche, but calling the, the the most fair match that you thought you could. And at the end of the day, you know, the right kid wins a match, which is what we're all 
here for is to make sure that everybody has fairness because if there wasn't officials, it'd just be a glorified practice, right? So when you do your job and, and to me, wrestling has been gotten so advanced from when I first started till now, holding a call through a scramble situation because obviously you being a new parent in the wrestling world, you've probably been in situations where there's one match going on and everybody in the gym yells two. And then you hold your call. You're not awarding it. You're not getting influenced by the gym or by the coaches or anything. Scramble continues. And then you can just feel all the air go out. And everybody's like, oh, okay, maybe that wasn't two. And you knew you just nailed that call right. State finals, I mean, it happens all the time where the gym yells two and it's not two and holding your calls. And I think just calling the perfect match is probably the most rewarding thing that there is for me um, when it comes to wrestling. But but also giving back to the sport, uh, you can go back to, you know, second graders and a lot of girls still do it. The, the girls are, so the, it's just a new sport, right? It's pure passion. It's pure fire. They're just happy to be there. And in girls wrestling in elementary, it's a pure, it's, it's, you're going to see it because when, when you call a match, win or lose, the girls will get up and they'll hug each other. It's like, oh man, that was fun. Or the elementary kids will go hug each other. Oh, that was fun. It's like, they don't care if you made a bad call or not. They're just enjoying time. And so when I see those moments like that, where, where kids are just in joyful win or lose, you know, that's about as pure as it gets. And that's a, that's a very rewarding moment there as well. All great stuff there. You know, we're, we're getting near the end of this podcast. Um, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a listener that stumbles upon the Ru- wrestling rules podcast here, and you're going to catch their interest. They're going to be like, hey, this sounds like something that I would enjoy doing. Um, What is it that a person can do to become a wrestling official? First part is, is I would say, don't don't probably start out like I did. Go go get certified right away. (laughs) Um, And 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 it's unique. We actually have we had one high schooler this year, uh, I believe, from Syracuse, Nebraska. You know, he, he. it, you're you're allowed to uh, go ahead, get the rule book, take the test, and and so I actually officiated with with a younger kid this weekend that was still in high school. Start there, start there, get the rule book, read it, don't don't skim it, read it. If you got questions, everybody's on the NSA website as a wrestling official, and any numbers on there, so you might be able to reach out to a veteran official, grab the state wrestling uh, program, and every official's name's in there. Go find it. Go on the NSA website. Find them, text them, be like, hey, this is so-and-so. I'm, I'm trying to get into wrestling. I'm going to take the test. There's not a single person in there that's not going to help you out. And we'll walk you through the NSA website. Um, so that's step one. Step two is, is don't be shy. Um, get out there. Start with club meets. Um, don't, don't, ex- don't expect to light the world on fire your first year, second year, third year. Uh, it, it's a process. And, and be, be a contract hog as much as you possibly can. Take your elementary, take your junior high, take your JV, because things start to slow down after that, and the wrestling gets better, and the wrestling officiating actually is easier to call, I think, at a varsity level than it is a JV level, than it is at a junior high level versus doing elementary. So if you can do all those and you feel comfortable, by all means, if you get that high school varsity contract, take it. Take it and run and see how you do. But uh, – Find a, find, a, find a mentor program. The Northeast Nebraska Official Association, Omaha, which would be the Metro Association, get, get with an association. And, and there really was no associations when I started. So it was, you had to be hungry, go find, your, go find somebody to help you along the way, where now, once you join an association, you're going to have ample amounts of help. And maybe your first varsity competition you get. Um, I remember I called Travis Stutzman my first varsity competition. He was a NSA official, didn't have anything going on. I said, hey, can you come watch me? And just having the presence of a senior official there really helped my confidence level. And he gave me coaching. Don't, don't be complacent and surround yourself with, with other senior officials. Like I said, I surrounded myself with Tony Cordova, Guy Cope, Trey Boyer. Those guys helped me tremendously. And I probably kept in contact with those guys for two to three years until I got in the state tournament. And then it, it just kind of formed like a brotherhood. Um, to get you that level and then be hungry. Um, 
I remember I started doing USA wrestling, AAU wrestling, and going to doing national tournaments before I even did the state tournament in the first year, because I, I would reach out to people across state lines and, and I would see social media posts of what's this NHSCA nationals out in Virginia beach. And I looked, went online, found a website, emailed them first year, didn't get in, emailed them, said, Hey, you know, here's my resume, sent them a resume, finally got into nationals and flew out to Virginia beach and, and ref that. And that's a, that was a whole nother level of officiating. And I did that the same year that I did the first year of the NSAA state individual tournament. So be willing to learn, be hungry. Don't be afraid to travel, get a part of association or all those little steps you can take as a first year official. And you can join an association before getting certified as an NSA official. And I know like the Northeast Nebraska, we'll, we'll go through the test and help you. We won't give you all the answers, but we'll, we'll help you with any questions, tell you where, where to find it in the rule book. And that's really the, the basic steps of, of how to get into officiating is right there. Well, James, I, I really appreciate you taking time out with PSOA today, telling your story of how you started as a wrestling official, how you advanced to the level that you are at now, and sharing the perspective of you know what you look for when it comes to stalling, illegal moves, and the, the near falls. Those of you out, out there, if you are looking to become a wrestling official, you could search us, time out with PSOA at Facebook. You could go to our website, www.premiersportsofficials.com, and we will help you find that local association anywhere in America. Uh, Because that is one thing that, as officials, it's a very small network and we're all connected somehow, some way. So don't hesitate. Don't wait to become a wrestling official. Get started now. James, thank you again. And officials out there, remember, you're only as good as your last call. A Heard at Sports Network production.